Hello and welcome to Round Robin. I'm your host, Robin McCormick, and as you can tell by the surroundings, we're in a very special place today. We're gonna to discuss the history of St. John's Episcopal Church, which is very, very closely tied and essentially the same history as the city of Hampton. My guest today is Jim Tormey. Welcome, Jim. Thank you. Actually, you should be welcoming me because I'm in, in your setting today. We're glad to have you here. Well, thank you, and thank you for sharing. And I know the history of this, I feel like I should whisper because I'm in a church. This is um, please, very different. Please don't. <laughs> okay. Um, is, um, is, a, is a, just an amazing building. And if you would, I know your history goes back well before this building, but if you could just start and tell us a little bit about the church that exists today and, and some of the very special features and ar architecture of it. This building uh, dates from 1728. At that time, the colonists had established Hampton as a town sufficiently to uh, want to have the church here. Previously, it had been located out Pembroke Avenue, about a mile. So that was quite a distance to walk or ride to get to church. So 1728, the city's laid out. We have King, Queen, King Street and Queen Street, and the church sits right prominently in the downtown. It does. Uh, they uh, commissioned Henry Carey, who had built the Wren buildings in Williamsburg, to build this church. The brick for the church was uh, excavated from the site. The bricks are made here. They're made in a Flemish bond, uh, which makes some people think that perhaps they were shipped from England, but not so. They're from here. The walls were two feet thick, and that's why you have this original building still standing. Uh, if not, it would have uh, come down in the fire of the Civil War. Right. The building was laid out in the form of a cross. The longest dimension is 75 feet, mm -hmm. and then it's 60 feet across the transepts. The aisles are 20 feet wide on either side. When originally built, this building would have had box pews. And right, like some of the ones you see at Bruton Parish now, right? Similar to the ones you see at uh, Bruton Parish today. Uh, you would not have had in that original church the stained glass windows, which you see here. They were clear glass then. They were clear glass, and it did not have an arched roof such as we have. They had a flat roof, but they did have three galleries, whereas we only have two. Third gallery would be uh, on the uh, water side, the south side, and it was there that uh, African Americans would have sat during the services. Uh, the uh, Red tiles that you see on the floor are similar to the tiles that we have in earlier churches from a uh, tile that was made here on the site. The church was paid for by the people of the community. Everybody was a member of this church. Because they, they had liked to be. It. That's they had right. to be a member. That's right. The church tax was probably the largest tax that they paid. Uh, that tax supported the minister. It uh, paid for the upkeep of the building and uh, any additions or whatever that might be made of the building. And it also took care of the poor. So if you had a person who was ill, he'd be cared for by the church and the charges would be uh, distributed amongst the community. Well, you know, that was such an interesting point when I was looking through your book because it, it suggested that the church really was a form of state back in the day. I mean, you, you had to be a member, you had to pay the tax, but the tax went to things that in this day and age, to some extent, government provides. It was yes. sort of the first public-private partnership. It was a safety net. Right, right, mm -hmm. and you got Indeed. the taxes, sort of a grant to, yes. to compensate for that. So tell us then, in the day when this church was first built, columnists, colonists had to be a member of the Church of England and had to attend a certain number of days a year um, what would it have been like here on a Sunday? How do people get here? What is a service like? Well, let me go back a bit. In the 1690s, there was an act of religious toleration had been passed. So a person at that time didn't have to come here. Ah, he could go okay. to another church, but he still had to pay taxes for here. And he had to go to another church. He couldn't get out of church. Church attendance was <laughs> Church attendance mandatory. was required, yes. Uh, they came, uh, many of them, by water because that was the easy way to come. And in fact, that door, the uh, south door to the church is called the water door. Uh, 
So people would come across um, come via the Hampton River and then leave their boats and yes. walk the couple blocks up here. And then, of course, the main roads that came out of town that went to the Back River area, the Yorktown roads and roads to Warwick County, all brought people here. So in the day, this parish was quite large. In fact, when, when St. John's was first established, way back in 1610, it was what, it, what is now Hampton, most of what is now Newport News, and some surrounding area. Yes, it, the parish covered the entire county. In fact, the, the name of this parish is still Elizabeth City Parish. It is, That goes okay. back to the original name. Date to the original Anglican. Mm -hmm. and, um, but you say it was, formal, it was informally known as the Kikitan Parish. Yes. So let's go back to those first days. Let's go back to 1610 and tell us what St. John's was like then. Well, in 1610, uh, the community was, of course, very small, maybe 25 people. Uh, John Rolfe mentions it in his report that he sent to the king in 1616. Uh, he said there were 10 farmers, and of course the rest would be soldiers and builders. Uh, but they brought their minister with them from uh, Jamestown. His Would, name was William Mays. And that shows how important the church was, that yes, you know, indeed. when you have only soldiers and farmers, basically what you need for economic and, and safety, mm -hmm. you still need that spiritual that was considered that important. Absolutely. Uh, in 1622, there was an Indian uprising, which uh, resulted in the deaths of 347 colonists. And while uh, Kekatan was not attacked, the people drew in across the east side of the river uh, to be farther away from the Indian threat. That was the site of the second church, which we know and today is located um, on the campus of Hampton University. The site of the first church has not been we exactly, it, but it's somewhere around Chesapeake and LaSalle, like right along the water, right? That is correct. Okay. And uh, near a small stream called Church Creek. Uh, 1623, the uh, second site was adapted in, it was a plain wooden church. And people uh, probably came on Sunday uh, really as much for social reasons as uh, any other, because it was a respite from the very difficult lives that they led. And, and back then there wasn't much town. Most people were farmers, lived far apart on a decent sized plot of land, right? They, they were engaged in tobacco growth uh, at that time, primarily. The pattern of uh, agriculture tended to shift with time. Uh, in the 1660s, there was a great hurricane. There was a flood stage of 12 feet, which if it occurred today would <sighs> put a good deal of Hampton underwater. Yeah. Uh, that caused them to rebuild, and they rebuilt on the west side, where the population was tending to shift anyway. That's probably and also, though, that hurricane pushed them way inland. The hurricane pushed them inland, and uh, that church was <coughs> used uh, until, as we said before, in the 1720s, they felt that uh, it was more appropriate to be here in, closer to the town. It was also a wooden church, uh, very modest, of about uh, 25 by 50 feet. Probably a rather uncomfortable place. This was considered a luxurious church in its time. Oh, I bet, compared yes. to especially some of the older ones. Now, didn't you also say in the early days that um, people with weapons, with swords, were ordered or expected to bring them to church? I mean, it was not a safe, you didn't have safe passage to It was an act of the General Assembly that all persons who were armed with muskets or carried swords would bring them to church. Because of the danger of traveling through lands shared the, from, taken from, whatever your perspective is, the, the Indians at the time. That's right, they had to be ready for anything because the nature of the uprisings was that they were very sudden. They were surprises. So this church, which is gorgeous, palatial by the standards, and, and still, you know, a, a beautiful and fairly large church, um, is then built in what time? 1728. Okay. 1728, yes. Now, uh, at the time that it was built, they wanted to have a steeple, and in 1760, they were able to afford a steeple. Uh, that 
was at the uh, west end of the church. And that stood for about a century. And then when the church was uh, destroyed by fire in the Civil War, the steeple came down, it was never rebuilt. But a tower was built that uh, houses the uh, dressing rooms for choirs and the vesting rooms for the clergy. So now let's go backward though. So you were in the colonial period and you're thriving because there's a tax and you are essentially supported by the state. What happens after the Revolutionary War? After the revolution, the church has hard times. There was uh, uh, repugnance for anything English. Uh, they did not want to pay the taxes. People never have wanted to be taxed. Right. Uh, and uh, so the church fell into disrepair. They were not able to afford a minister for a number of years. This uh, extended through the War of 1812 when Hampton was attacked by the British, occupied. This churchyard was used as a, a slaughterhouse for their animals. Uh, pews were stripped from the building. The roof had fallen in. Uh, the steeple was in bad repair. So it was already in bad shape, and then the British come and occupy and, and pillaged make it, make it worse. quite a bit. That's yes. right. Pillaged all of Hampton, yes. but including St. John's. Yes. Then in the 1820s, uh, a very uh, forthright woman by the name of Jane Barron Hope uh, was Barron is a name we know, and Hope actually too, Hope Street. Yes, uh, was uh, visiting the graveyard with a cousin, John Servant, and she turned to him and said, uh, if I were a man cousin, I would build up these walls. And he wrote later that he was energized by her words, and he went immediately to Norfolk to seek funds from friends and relatives. And uh, they reestablished the church, and it was rebuilt by the 1820s, uh, I think it was, reconsecrated in 1828. So then it had a, a pretty decent thriving period again. It, it did indeed until, up until the Civil War. The Civil War. Yes. And tell us what happened. I mean, I've seen the, is it a photograph or a drawing that is so famous where you can see almost nothing in, in downtown Hampton but the walls of St. John's and that, a few chimneys. There are both photographs and okay. drawings of that. Uh, very stark time. Uh, and only bricks remained. And the Confederates retreating burned, I mean, it said some of them burned their own homes, started the fires in their own homes, divided the city up into quadrants and set fire to everything on yes. their way out. Yes, it was uh, done to deny the use of the town to the Union, which had temporarily withdrawn its men away from Hampton. They had occupied Hampton. Then after the first Manassas, they had to send some of their troops north, so they pulled back out of Hampton. At that time, General Magruder, uh, the commander of the Confederate forces, sent Captain Phillips to Hampton. Uh, they determined that they were going to burn the town. They quartered uh, their horses here at the church walls. They went to the intersection of King and Queen Street. And they spread out in the four quadrants and burned the town, including Why? the church. Why did the walls survive? I mean, that is just the most amazing picture when you see, well, certainly there weren't that many brick structures. I mean, that's why there's mm -hmm. fireplaces in homes that survive, but not the entire home, but. Well, the walls survived here because they were so thick. They how how two, thick are they, Jim? They're two feet thick. Wow. Uh, the length of two and a half bricks. And originally that was for withstanding attack or just for withstanding attack from Indians, withstanding hurricanes, withstanding, who knew that I think that's the way you built churches in those days, if you had the, uh, if you had the means. had the means to do so. So then after the Civil War, um, it took a while for the church to, to be rebuilt. Yes, once again, there was a rebuilding period. Uh, church services were held in a uh, meeting house that was near the uh, uh, courthouse. And in 1669, the retired chaplain of Fort Monroe came to be the minister. And uh, at that point, uh, many of the families who had lived here had returned and the church was uh, resumed uh, and healthy again. Well, it really, it is amazing, and, and St. John's is one of Hampton's firsts, and in fact, one of our most important firsts. It was the 
is the oldest continuous parish, Anglican parish, yes. in the United States. Yes. Um, and we're real pleased that uh, the uh, church is so close <coughs> to the uh, History Museum, and when the school children visit the History Museum as a part of their uh, instruction, that they're able to come over here to St. John's and see this building and hear about it. I know I certainly brought my Cub Scouts here when we were learning about the history of Hampton. We would do the museum and the graveyard and then sometimes the church. Tell us a little bit about the, the churchyard because you have a number of notables buried out there and graves that date back to, to 17 this building. one is the earliest grave. Of course, that predates the, the building. The building, uh, but uh, that was a, a grave of Willis Wilson who was the property owner here earlier. Uh, the church started with an acre and a half. Uh, the graveyard grew in increments uh, as it required more space. And uh, that was important to the town too because it was a town cemetery. And people of all faiths are buried here, including ministers of other faiths. Uh, today there are probably 3,000 graves here. and. Uh, the six acres were acquired bit by bit as they needed more space. Okay, so tell us just a little bit about the church today. It is still an active parish. You have services here every Sunday. Yes, uh, we have a, a congregation of approximately 500 people and uh, we have a very fine organ, which- uh, Which they didn't have in the earliest we days. Did not have in the earliest days, of course. That, that uh, organ dates from uh, the uh, 1970s uh, when it was decided to have an organ in keeping with the architecture of the old church. And the stained uh, so glass have, is a, a little bit newer as well. The stained glass has been donated over the years. Uh, much of it is made from the uh, Willett Studio in Philadelphia. Uh, and is donated by people from time to time uh, one particularly interesting window, well, we have many interesting windows, but one that's interesting is one that depicts the baptism of Pocahontas. Uh, we have another which is dedicated to the colonial clergy because there were, uh, of course, colonial clergymen uh, from 1610 until 1776. All of those clergymen had to go to England in order to be ordained because there were no bishops uh, yeah. in America. Uh, we have the names of every one of those men in that, that window. It's one of the rarest windows we have. Oh, that's wonderful. And your silver, your communion silver also has an amazing story actually. Yes, the communion silver was uh, made in 1618 and was a gift of a Mrs. Mary Robinson of London to the people of Virginia. It was located <clears throat> at Smith's Hundred, which was further upstream toward Jamestown. And uh, that community was wiped out in the Indian uprising. And uh, so it was decided to give the silver here where there was the largest parish in, the, uh, in uh, Virginia. Uh, how it has managed to survive through all these years. All I the don't wars know. and the Where pillaging. it was during the wars and the Fires. Mm. difficult periods. That's, that's quite amazing. And they still don't know who hit it during actually either we, period. We do not know who hit it, uh, but they hit it well because uh, it's still in use uh, on special occasions. All right, Jim, so if someone wants to come see the church, obviously they can attend a Sunday service. You have two every Sunday, mm -hmm. but you also have certain open hours where people could call for a tour, is that? Yes, accurate? they can call on any weekday and uh, generally they can come uh, on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday to visit. And the cemetery gates are open during daytime hours? The, or? the cemetery gates are open and uh, visitors are welcome. It's an amazing and peaceful place to walk. Occasionally when I'm going from one building to the other downtown, I'll cut through and just take a moment, you know, to relax and take in that history. Because here you are sort of in this bustling downtown and there is this very um, integral part of our history that dates back to such a different day, but is in active use still. And that, yes. that tradition carries on with it's, people like you and the other parishioners here. Well, it's particularly welcoming. Uh, it seems to me the time that the uh, crepe myrtle is uh, in blossom and uh, uh, 
during the various seasons we have flowering trees. Well, it's a beautiful and special place, Jim, and I thank you for letting us come and, and bring it to people on TV so they get a chance to see it as well. And I hope they'll come see it in person. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. And thank you for watching this episode of Brown Robin.